Okay, welcome to today's uh, lesson on star formation. We're going to talk about how stars are formed, um, basically uh, how they come together. And we're going to see that it's actually a pretty common process despite the size of the stars. Stars come in a variety of different masses. Um, technically, to uh, be considered a star, to be hot enough to fuse hydrogen in the core, you actually have to be anywhere from about 8% to 10% of the mass of the sun. Um, some models show us that uh, it is possible to uh, have fusion in the core at as low as 6% of the mass of the sun, but uh, you know, really 8% is um, a much more reliable figure for uh, where stars begin. As far as where the upper mass limit is, it's probably somewhere about 100 to 200 times the mass of our sun. Uh, some theories do place the upper limit at the very beginning of the universe, or around 1,000 times the mass of the sun. But uh, currently, um, due to the presence of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium, the, uh, the, the limit really is uh, you know, right around 100 times the mass of the sun, because anything larger would require so much nuclear power to support its weight, uh, the star would literally tear itself apart. So in any case, we're going to talk about uh, where the material comes from, how the stars evolve, and um, you know how they become uh, much like our sun is today. So we start with, first of all, interstellar mediums. This is any material that is not in the stars. Inter, meaning between. Stellar, meaning star. The stuff that's between the star is really stars, is really what is going to be the material that we use to create stars. And um, again, before you know, we, we actually talk about star formation, um, we look at the raw ingredients. And, and really, this interstellar medium is, is really rather simple. It's made of gas and dust. And uh, the gas and dust really comes in a variety of different densities. Some of the um, interstellar medium is extremely uh, tenuous. Uh, especially the, the interstellar medium between galaxies uh, can have only a few atoms uh, you know, per cubic meter. Um, in other places, the interstellar medium is dense enough, um, you know, much less dense than, than even our own atmosphere, but dense enough to uh, even block light. So in terms of um, what this interstellar medium is, it's, it's uh, primarily the material that was left over from the formation of the universe, but also additional material which has been uh, created by other stars. Again, um, it comes in two basic components, gas. Most of this is hydrogen and helium. The uh, gas from the uh, original Big Bang is uh, almost all hydrogen and helium. There are some gases that were created by uh, heavier stars, which then uh, blew up and blew this material into space. But all of the dust at one point um, being composed of heavier compounds than uh, helium, all this dust at one time was manufactured inside a star. A lot of the dust is made out of carbon, but includes other things like silicon, um, you know, metals, iron, you know, everything that uh, is very important for creating planets like our own Earth. So approximately 75% of the, the gas is hydrogen by weight, 25% is helium, with a trace amount of oxygen, nitrogen, neon, um, and everything heavier. Um, it does include some molecules, such as water vapor, uh, you know, even gases like carbon monoxide and, and uh, cyanogen, which are very toxic. Um, but again, um, the solid components of the interstellar medium are these dust grains. And, and when we think of dust, we think of particles that are you know, large enough to be seen with the eye. The interstellar dust grains are actually much smaller than that. Um, for the most part, uh, they can be just a few molecules that are stuck together, uh, where the largest would be about a tenth of a millimeter. 
And again, the material in the dust grains are mainly made out of the heavier materials, carbon, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, sulfur, calcium, iron, nickel, where the oxygen would be combined with these other elements um, to form solids. Now, there are basically um, different regions um, that are identified. In, in our universe. Uh, there's the hot ionized region, which is really the, the lowest of, of all densities. Um, this stuff is just not dense enough to uh, uh, form stars. The interesting thing about this is this very low density region is actually extremely hot. Um, the stars themselves, the radiation from the stars, since there's so few atoms in this interstellar medium, ionizes this uh, gas and makes it into a plasma where it uh, is, you know, well over a million degrees uh, Kelvin, much like our own sun um, is, uh, is over a million degrees. The problem is it only contains about uh, 100 to 10,000 atoms per cubic meter. Well, that may sound like a lot. That is uh, better than the best vacuum that we can create on Earth. So when you're looking at the dark regions of the sky, we're mainly looking through this hot ionized region. Um, again, it's far too low for stars to form from this, but uh, we can see a weak uh, presence of this ionized region because if we look at starlight, there's um, something called the Lyman uh, forest. It's weak absorption lines from this ionized gas, which can be seen from stars that are far away. Slightly more dense, slightly cooler is the warm ionized region. Um, still much too uh, low in density to form um, stars and much too hot. Um, a lot of this warm ionized region is primarily in the disk of our own galaxy. And um, again, you know, it, it just doesn't have the, the uh, density and, and low temperature that we need. There's a warm neutral region, which is even uh, closer to the plane of the galaxy, and then a cold neutral region, which is um, in the densest parts of our galaxy. Um, really, the only place that we see star formation um, are in what are called molecular clouds. Uh, basically, you know, think about a gas. When we heat a gas, it tends to expand. When you cool a gas, it tends to contract. We need a gas that's cool enough that <clears throat> the molecules can come together and form something dense like a star. But we also need enough density here so that gravity can overcome any of the thermal pressure. You heat a gas, it wants to expand, um, so we need gravity to act against this. Now, molecular clouds are... Um, uh, of a fairly high density as, as interstellar, the interstellar medium goes, but still uh, a very good vacuum compared to anything we can produce on, on the Earth. Its density is about um, one million, I'm sorry, one billion to a trillion time atoms per um, cubic meter. But, uh, you know, if left alone, even the molecular cloud wouldn't spontaneously start. Uh, producing stars. Now, the temperature of these clouds is, is fairly cool. It's anywhere from about 20 degrees Kelvin to about 50 degrees Kelvin. And the molecular clouds, as seen in this image right here, primarily uh, s stick around the, um, the, uh, the disk of our galaxy. This is actually looking toward the center of our galaxy. And this line right here represents the plane of our galaxy. Um, this spot right here is uh, the center. And again, you can see all these different molecular clouds around it. Uh, even in the infrared, they, they appear to be fairly dark. There's some hot ionized regions which glow red, but uh, these molecular clouds is where we're going to see star formation. Here's a picture of another galaxy. Um, and again, this is taken in the infrared. We can see again these orange regions, or these reddish-orange regions. 
these again are molecular clouds, and this is where we're going to see uh, new stars forming. Now, associated with molecular clouds, but not a true star forming region, are what are called H2 regions. H for hydrogen, 2 meaning the second state of hydrogen. Neutral hydrogen is called hydrogen 1. If I ionize hydrogen, I take away the electron, it becomes hydrogen 2. This hydrogen 2 glows with sort of a pinkish color um, because it gives off both hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta lines. But the H2 regions are generally parts of the molecular cloud which have been superheated by massive stars. The massive stars produce a lot of ultraviolet light. This causes the gas to fluoresce. These are real nice indicators that star formation is taking place. Now, once again, the H2 regions, they're really too hot, okay? These emission nebula, as they're called, are too hot, and the densities become too low for star formation to take place. But once the stars form, and if these stars are, are hot enough and massive enough, they will ionize part of the molecular cloud, producing these beautiful emission nebula. Here's um, one of those uh, molecular clouds, and there's a very massive hot blue star, uh, which is right there. And you can just see this bubble surrounding that blue star from its uh, stellar wind, but all the ultraviolet light is, is lighting this, the surrounding regions up. A good example of an H2 region is the Great Orion Nebula. The Great Orion Nebula is in the constellation Orion, and if you look at Orion, uh, right below the belt is Orion's sword. The middle star in that sword is this nebula. And at the center of it, there's some really hot um, young stars. One of them is an O star. And although it's only 1,500 light years away, you can see it very easily with the naked eye. This uh, cluster of hot stars is called the trapezium cluster. And here's a better view of it with less of the nebula exposed. And again, there's that hot blue blue star, the O star, and, and a lot of the B stars around it. These stars give off ultraviolet light, and it causes the surrounding nebula to glow. Another constellation in Orion, which with these H2 uh, regions, is a horsehead nebula. Now, the horsehead nebula actually has a dark molecular cloud in front of a lighter emission nebula. And uh, we currently think that like the Orion Nebula, there are new stars that are forming at that location. In fact, the Horsehead Nebula and the Orion Nebula are part of the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. This is a huge cloud um, that when we're looking off into space, this huge cloud um, contains many different emission nebula, and it's a, it's a great place for, for new stars to form. Horsehead Nebula is here. The Great Orion Nebula is here. There's actually another nebula here. But um, if you don't recognize uh, Orion, by the way, um, this is going from Betelgeuse to the top star. Here's going from uh, top star to the belt to Rigel, from Rigel to Bellatrix, back up to the belt, there's the belt, and finally finishing off Orion, back to Betelgeuse, you can see the shoulder. So the Orion Nebula actually sits in um, a part of the sky where we're looking at this uh, large molecular cloud. Uh, the stars, the, the main stars of the Orion Nebula are actually in front of this molecular cloud. So um, you can see uh, you know, these molecular clouds are, are really quite large. Um, you know, this is over a thousand light years away, but yet it fills up a, a pretty large part of the sky. So when looking at the different parts of the interstellar medium, the hot, low-density regions, they're not going to form stars. Um, we're not going to get star formation at the hot ionized region, which tends to be in the outer fringes of our galaxy, the warm ionized, the warm neutral region, which is closer to the disk, or even the cold neutral regions. 
the only place that we're going to get star formation is in these molecular clouds. Once the stars start forming, especially those massive stars, they're going to blow the molecular cloud apart. And these H2 regions, again, become too hot and too low in density for new stars to form. So, um, you know, basically star formation happens only in one place. And um, that's where the gas is cold. And that is where the gas is very dense. So again, the interstellar medium is any material found between stars. Um, it's made of gas and dust, but only the molecular clouds, only the densest, coldest parts um, are able to produce stars. Because these are dark, molecular clouds are oftentimes very difficult to see. So um, in order to find star-forming regions, scientists will often look for uh, these emission nebulas, these uh, clouds that, that glow very brightly due to the ultraviolet light from, from hot stars, okay? Many of these H2 regions actually exist um, within the molecular clouds themselves, like the Orion molecular cloud complex. Now, the problem is, even the molecular cloud by itself is going to just spontaneously make a star. These clouds are pretty much in what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. They're basically just sitting there. You have two forces. You have the internal thermal force, okay? They're not at absolute zero, so there's still some thermal pressure that's going to support them. Just like hot stars use the heat from the core to uh, support their, their, their masses, these clouds, being very low in density, are able to uh, support their own masses um, due, to, due, due to even small amounts of heat. Also, um, we have to worry about the other internal force, such as uh, magnetic pressure. Um, these clouds have a very weak magnetic field. The problem is, if you try to compress the clouds to make a star, the magnetic field will become more intense and it will resist any of this compression. Finally, gravity, the primary force trying to create the compression, while thermal force and magnetic pressure generally opposes compression, gravity is what um, needs to come into play to cause these things to collapse. Now, we need a source of compression. Where do we get the destabilizing forces that are going to overcome the thermal and magnetic pressures and allow gravity to take over and do its work? Well, not surprisingly, some of the most energetic events in the universe um, help cause uh, some of these collapses. And the death of a star, such as a supernova explosion, will actually trigger the production of new stars. Um, the other possibility is molecular clouds can collide. When they do so, they create a fluctuation in density, and this could also um, you know, change the uh, stability of the cloud. In a molecular cloud, when the O and B stars form, the pressure from their winds um, will actually cause additional compression and um, further create stars. And on a galactic level, um, galaxies like our own Milky Way, they're spiral galaxies which contain these huge spiral density waves. Spiral density waves move throughout the galaxy and actually compress the molecular clouds as they pass through them initiating more um, star formation. Any of the four processes above can disrupt the local magnetic field and aid in the production of, of stars. So with supernova explosions, again, supernova is an exploding star, typically a very massive old star. When it explodes, the shock wave um, will create a huge increase in the local pressure and this could uh, overcome both the thermal and uh, magnetic pressure and cause the cloud to collapse. Here's one of the recent supernova that we've been able to study. And uh, it's supernova 1987A. As you can tell, the supernova are uh, 
named after the year that they're discovered. And this one took place in the Large Magellanic Cloud. You can see um, the shock wave from one year to a few years later uh, slowly expands, and as it does so, it interacts with the, the matter around the star. Again, clouds can collide. Um, galaxies can collide. And uh, when individual clouds either uh, pass by one another or galaxies collide, causing stars to, uh, I'm sorry, clouds to interact with one another, this can disrupt, again, both their, uh, their hydrostatic equilibrium, but also their magnetic fields. Again, O and B stars. Very, very bright, very, very hot. You can see right here how this cluster of, of very massive stars is pushing away all the material around them. Spiral density waves. Here's a picture of a spiral galaxy. And clearly you can see that um, it does have the spiral structure to it, that the spiral waves radiate out from the center. And these can be thought of as just pressure waves, which are moving around the, uh, the galaxy. And everywhere they uh, cross, uh, the molecular clouds will be comp compressed and they will uh, begin to form stars. In any case, be it a supernova explosion, be it a um, collision between clouds, the influence of a uh, massive star and, and its strong stellar wind, or even the spiral waves, this will disrupt the local magnetic field. Right here, we see a picture of the Great Orion Nebula and the Orion Molecular co Cloud Complex and um, what's been seen is that the magnetic field has actually been greatly twisted. And this has allowed uh, parts of the, the cloud to collapse and form new stars. Now, when these clouds collapse, they don't collapse into one single very massive star. The process of star formation um, is, is very uh, chaotic. Um, the cloud begins to, uh, first of all, um, fragment or break into uh, higher density regions. And each of these cores or um, fragments will um, collapse into uh, individual uh, stars later on. This is a look into uh, the region around the Orion Nebula. You can see these hot clumps. Actually, what's happened here is some of these clumps have already started to form stars. Here's another good view of um, some of this, this fragmentation taking place. And uh, this is actually quite a mature system. Here's a molecular cloud. We already have some hot stars that are formed toward the center of it. And as they form, they interact with the surrounding material. And you can see that it's no longer one big happy molecular cloud. It's now fragmented into pieces of different densities and, and different uh, sizes. So um, a single cloud doesn't evolve into a single star. A single cloud begins to fragment. First stars are, are born, begin to interact with the rest of it, and then more stars are formed. Um, it's a long, drawn-out process that converts a molecular cloud into a cluster of stars. But the fragments do collapse, and as they collapse, most of the material settles at the, the center of it. We're in a very hot, um, ball of gas that we call a protostar. As it contracts, every cloud has a little bit, or every cloud fragment ha has a little bit of rotation to it. And just like a figure skater doing a pirouette, as it contracts, just like the figure skater pulling in his or her arms, begins to spin faster and faster, and this whole thing begins to flatten out. So the stars form with a central uh, precursor. Uh, it's not really a star yet, but um, a central ball of very hot gas at the, at the center, something that will eventually become a star. And surrounding that, there is a huge disk of, of infalling material. Now, as the material makes its way onto this hot protostar, 
some of the material is um, sent off into space in these high-speed jets called bipolar jets. And again, you can see here, um, one of these cloud fragments has uh, contracted. And on the inside, although it might not be visible from, from, from the outside, but on the inside, this hot disk of, of infilling material is formed. And at the center of that, you have the protostar. Here's an actual picture of one of those disks. You can see the protostar at the center of it. Again, this is found in the Orion Nebula. This is a uh, protoplanetary disk. Um, it's called a protoplanetary disk because um, planets will form within it. And uh, you know, basically, even though most of the material uh, from the molecular cloud fragment falls into the star itself, uh, there's always enough material left over to form perhaps a few planets. Another picture of one of these disks. Another picture of an actual disk. The other one was a drawing. Again, you can see this edge-on picture where the star is clearly at the center of it, and then there's a disk of material around it. Now here are six different pictures showing that this is fairly commonplace. You know, in science, we can have all these great theories, but unless we have experimental evidence, um, it's not a scientific theory. Uh, so what we look for um, are you know, similar structures in these molecular clouds, and we do see them time and time again. And um, here we can actually see, uh, you know, the disk sort of edge on. Here's the uh, star at the center. This disk is a little bit at an angle. Here's another disk again, pretty much at an angle. This one's seen edge on. But again, um, no matter where we look, all of these seem to have the same feature. A hot protostar at the center, and then a disk surrounding it. Now, there's a big problem with forming these stars from these rotating clouds. During the star formation, the protostar is going to receive a very large amount of angular momentum from the original cloud. Even though the cloud might not have been rotating very quickly, the fact that it's contracted to a very small object, such as a protostar, means that um, it's, it's going to really have a, a fast rate of rotation. Now, this rotation should be so fast, it should really prevent the formation of most stars. However, during the formation, um, the disk and the bipolar jet take some of the angular momentum away from the protostar and actually allow it to slow down a little bit. Um, so, uh, Again, this, this transfer of angular momentum is very important for the star to be able to form because if it spins too fast, it's never going to come together. The other interesting thing is due to the, the rapid rotation, the protostar actually has a very intense magnetic field. This magnetic field will interact very sharply with the disk surrounding it and actually allow the star to uh, slow its its uh, it's spin down a little bit. Um, so the magnetic field it, it becomes a very important uh, ingredient in the star formation in that it let, lets it uh, start rotating uh, slower and uh, reduces the uh, centripetal force that, that would otherwise make star formation difficult. But again, as the star is forming, um, matter from the disk falls into the, the, uh, the protostar uh, or in this case, we're showing you the proto-sun, you know, the ball of gas that eventually became the sun. But at the same time, this polar jet takes away excess energy and excess angular momentum, uh, allowing the protostar to cool and often contract, uh, but also allowing it to get rid of uh, its high spin rate. Unfortunately, in... Um, 
win, but we can't see actual movies. But uh, if you view the original file, you could actually see that the polar jet is taking material away from the uh, protostar, which is located right here. And again, here's a star forming. Um, most of the star is hidden beneath the uh, rotating disk. The disk is uh, basically horizontal here. Here's a line sort of bisecting it. And what we see here are the bipolar jets producing big shock fronts known as Herbic Harrow objects. And the Herbic Harrow objects, um, when they were first discovered, were very mysterious. Now we know today that in many of these, we can't see the star. The star that's actually forming is very dark and hidden in here. But as the material breaks free from the disk, it interacts with other interstellar media, and um, these bright objects uh, are the result. So again, the most massive stars um, form uh, you know, similar to all the other stars. However, uh, models for star formation sort of indicated that stars should only be able to form up to about 10 to about 20 times the mass of the sun before they get too hot too quickly. And that would heat the gas in the disk and therefore just cause it to disperse into space. New observations, however, show that some of the more massive stars can actually protect some of this infalling gas that they form these big donut-shaped objects, these big toruses on the inner edge of the protoplanetary disk. This shields the infalling matter from getting too hot and just boiling away into space. It allows these stars to grow much larger than they would actually be predicted to get. However, even this mechanism can't produce stars of the largest size that we observe. Stars above 100 times the mass of the sun um, probably form uh, not as single objects, but probably form as many large stars that, that are in close proximity. And they simply merge together to make a much larger star. What's clear is, um, for the average ordinary star, our models are probably pretty accurate for what, ha what took place during their formation. Stars like our sun, nothing really complicated is needed in order to get them to form. It's the most massive stars, which are extremely rare, whose processes are, are understood the least. Now, once they're a protostar, they're basically a fairly spherical ball of gas. How does this protostar, which is much bigger than the star it will become, actually become a full functioning star? Now, the protostar is hot not because there's nuclear fusion taking place in it, but because gravity has converted some of the gravitational potential energy into thermal energy. Problem is, is thermal energy won't last forever. Once a star stops contracting, there's no more gravitational energy to heat it up. Something else has to kick in. Now, again, there are competing forces here. Okay? Thermal pressure wants to cause a star to expand. As long as the core is hot, the thermal pressure can oppose the other force, gravitational pressure. Okay? So gravitational pressure is the compressional force. Thermal pressure is the force that tries to get the star to expand. When the thermal pressure exceeds the gravitational pressure, <clears throat> the star is going to expand. When the gravitational pressure is larger, the star contracts. So slowly as the star cools off on the outside, the thermal pressure lessens, the gravity pressure increases. Now, a good example of a very young star, one that's gone from being a protostar to almost a, a new fully functioning star, is a Titari star. It's a small or medium mass star that um, is still contracting, so most of its energy is coming from gravity. However, at the center... Um, fusion is just beginning to start, okay? Um, these stars, when they were first discovered, had a tremendous amount of infrared light, but not as much visible light. 
we now know today that the infrared light was coming from gas, which had just formed the star not too long ago, re this residual gas, which would heat up due to the star's surface and then re-radiate infrared light into space. When does it become a star? Well, again, only when the star's core becomes hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium or some other light element into a heavier element. The way for this to happen is the gravitational pressure has to be great enough. And that's why if the star is not massive enough, if it's less than about 8% of the mass of the sun, it's never going to form a star because there's not enough gravitational energy to generate the heat to get fusion going. Now, the first thing to fuse is a heavy element isotope of hydrogen known as deuterium. Um, there's not a lot of deuterium there, so there's not a lot of fuel uh, from this. But um, deuterium fusion uh, is the first to kick in, and then rapidly migrates to the outer layers of the protostar. Um, the interesting thing is deuterium fusion, because it provides extra energy, okay, provides extra heat. It allows a star to grow uh, before hydrogen fusion shuts down um, the growth of the star. Uh, it basically delays uh, hydrogen fusion and allows matter to keep falling in. When the star's core does get hot enough, um, it's basically fusing hydrogen into hydrogen. And um, this happens... Uh, at a critical temperature of 4 million degrees, uh, basically it has to happen after all the deuterium is used up. But um, when this does happen, the star surface is going to become hot and the, the infalling matter is just going to be dispersed into space. The, the turning on of the, of, of the hydrogen fusion ends any growth that the star can have. Even more massive stars can fuse hydrogen through a process known as a CNO cycle. And this is sort of interesting because in this, hydrogen combines with um, other elements which are basically recycled. Um, hydrogen, first of all, combines with carbon um, to form nitrogen. The nitrogen then um, combines with, uh, then decays back into carbon. Carbon then combines with hydrogen to form nitrogen again. That decays into oxygen. And then um, decays into nitrogen and back into to carbon again. So what goes in is hydrogen. What goes out is helium. But um, this reaction takes place at even higher temperatures, at about 17 million degrees Kelvin. So, here we have it. The molecular cloud, it is basically the ingredient that is going to become the star. Once the star is, um, once the molecular cloud is contracted, there's a protostar at the center and a disk of infalling material around that. Initially, um, deuterium fusion happens, which heats up the star, allowing it to expand a little bit. But once the star begins to fuse uh, hydrogen, once the core gets hot enough, um, the protostar will heat up to become a regular star, and all the infalling material surrounding the star will just get blown away into space. Now, what happens when the protostar that's forming isn't large enough to become a real star? What happens when the protostar that is formed just doesn't have enough gravitational pressure to heat that core up and the engine never gets started? Well, that's what we call a brown dwarf. Um, a brown dwarf is a very low mass protostar um, that may have formed just like our sun, but again, the core temperatures were never reached to get nuclear fusion going, so um, it's sort of like the engine never turns over. The engine never starts. The protostar does start out hot. Or the brown dwarf does start out hot. But without nuclear fusion, um, the gravitational energy 
only lasts so long before it goes away. The brown dwarf will basically um, just sputter and uh, cool over millions, if not billions of years. Now, brown dwarfs form basically with a mass of about uh, 1% of the sun all the way up to a mass of 6.5% of the sun. <laughs> Anything lower than that is not going to be considered to be a, um, a star-like object. Um, basically, below 1.3% uh, of the mass of the sun, um, it's unable to fuse deuterium or lithium, and it's more planet-like than anything else. It's more like Jupiter. Now, higher masses would allow the, the fusion of hydrogen above 8% of the mass of the sun, and hydrogen fusion will become stable. Um, sort of the, the, the gray area is between 6.5% and 8%. We don't know really where to put that. Is it really a brown dwarf? Because um, hydrogen fusion only happens sporadically? Or is it a uh, star? Now, the brown dwarf does um, start out hot. It will continue to convert gravitational energy into heat. But it's basically just uh, shrinking and cooling during the, its, uh, its, life, its lifetime. Um, the only thing that's keeping it up um, eventually after it cools is something called degenerate pressure. And the degenerate pressure of the electrons balanced against the uh, force of gravity. Um, essentially, the brown dwarf is just going to be a, a cold, failed ember. Um, when we look at areas with star formation, we see a lot of low mass objects, and, and many of these might be uh, brown dwarfs. Um, some might be uh, red dwarf stars. But again, uh, the brown dwarfs without any additional heat input will simply just cool out and, and, and uh, fade away with time. A red dwarf, however, once that nuclear fusion has begun, it'll continue to, uh, you know, burn hydrogen, if you will. It's not really burning, it's fusing hydrogen to helium. It will continue to uh, uh, produce heat and will become stable. The red dwarf basically remains at a fairly constant temperature whereas the brown dwarf will uh, uh, get cooler. Now, a red dwarf is basically a small star, much smaller than the sun, anywhere from 8% of the mass of the sun up to about a half the mass of the sun. Now, from the beginning of its life, um, it will uh, radiate very little energy, and therefore it's going to last a very long time. Here's uh, the HR diagram showing um, where these red dwarfs start out. Uh, when the red dwarfs first form, the protostars are, you know, not that hot, but they're fairly large. As they contract, they settle down to the bottom of the um, HR diagram, and essentially uh, the red dwarf just remains at a constant temperature although its surface area becomes smaller and smaller, so it becomes less and less bright. So this is sort of a nice schematic showing what we'd expect from a protostar. You know, it starts as a big, cool ball of gas um, and just gradually keeps shrinking, really not changing, temp not changing its surface temperature at all, but because it's getting smaller, it's getting less and less bright. As we'll find out in the next chapter, um, red dwarfs can remain um, active for perhaps a trillion years, much longer than the current age of the universe. So, um, you know, they're uh, probably one of the most stable objects uh, that we know of. Stars like our sun burn a little bit hot, hotter, burn a little bit faster and have shorter lifespans than, than red dwarfs. 
We call these solar mass stars because they have about the same mass as, as our sun. Um, like the red dwarfs, they're going to start out as a big ball of, of, uh, of uh, somewhat cool gas. It's not really cool. It's about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. But as they contract, instead of staying at a constant temperature like the red dwarf, they're going to get hotter and hotter. And eventually, the core is going to become hot enough where nuclear fusion begins. Now, the more mass of the star, the hotter and denser it's going to become after the contraction. Okay? Um, at one solar mass, it will keep contracting until it becomes a D-class star. At four times the mass of the sun, it will keep contracting until it becomes an A-class star. But again, when we're looking at the HR diagram, these... Uh, protostars uh, start out here, again, lower temperature, maybe about 2,000 degrees Kelvin. As they contract, instead of moving straight downward like the, um, the, the red dwarfs, what they tend to do is they tend to move sort of at an angle. There's some hiccups in the, in the way. As they get larger and larger, um, they move almost horizontally. As far as how long do these stars take to form? Well, red giants, I'm sorry, red uh, dwarfs, um, which have an upper limit of one half the mass of the sun, um, really take the longest to form because there's the least amount of gravitational pressure <laughs> pulling them together. There it takes about 200 million years for it to reach the main sequence. Stars twice as heavy like our sun take less time. And again, the more massive they are, the shorter the time period becomes. Now, once again, the most massive stars form similarly to the red dwarves and, and our own sun. Um, however, everything's bigger and faster for them. Now, we've already said that the, 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 the largest of these form a protective torus around them, and, and the, the ones that are at the extreme end, might merge from smaller stars. But again, uh, the mass of stars all start the same way as, as everything else. You're going to start as a protostar, and uh, as they contract, um, the core temperature is going to get hotter and hotter until finally the cores turn on. So looking at the evolution of these uh, protostars, um, you know, the protostars are bigger, so they're going to start out slightly higher on the HR diagram. But instead of going sort of at an angle like our, our, our sun did on the HR diagram as it evolved, these stars almost go purely horizontally from left to right. And... Um, Again, um, they start out as, as big balls of, of, of gas. Uh, they contract until finally enough gravitational energy has been converted to heat, and the cores turn on. Um, stars four times the mass of our, our sun um, take only a million years to stabilize from the time that they first start contracting to the time that they reach the main sequence. Bigger than that, and it's, the year, it's in the hundreds of thousands of years. And the most massive stars um, uh, contract so quickly that generally they can become unstable and, and completely skip the whole main sequence. Again, stars greater than about 20 solar masses um, uh, really generate so much heat and their surface temperatures are so high that they have strong stellar winds, and the stellar wind's going to take away mass from the surface of the star. Again, it's thought that no star can really form with a mass greater than about 100 to 150 times the mass of the sun, because any bigger than that, the, the temperatures would be so high, the gas would just simply boil away into space, or the outer layers would simply just rip away out into space. So again, um, all stars form very similarly. We start with a molecular cloud. 
the molecular cloud forms a protostar in a fragment. It's surrounded by a protoplanetary disk. The protostar contracts and heats up when it reaches a critical temperature. When its density becomes high enough, nuclear fusion begins. And the star will continue to collapse until the thermal pressure from the core becomes balanced with the gravitational pressure from the outside. So, um, again, that's sort of your summary of events. Molecular cloud fragments forms a disk. Protostar forms at the center of that. And that protostar eventually uh, stabilizes. Nuclear fusion begins to form a star. Okay, that's it for today's lecture. And I will probably um, have the next lecture that talks about um, the smaller stars.